series of lectures. Um, yes, as I said, the National Trust is so very happy to host, um, well, help assist host in these, these series of lectures. Um, we are very, very interested in education when it comes to history, archaeology, and heritage. So we are very happy to do this. Um, so let me, I think we have enough people now. So let me send you to Dr. Guy. Dr. Guy, take it away. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I would like to thank the National Trust of Trinidad and Tobago. And I am Dr. Levis Guy Obiako, the director of the Scarborough Harbor Project. I would particularly like to thank at the trust, uh, the CEO, Ms. Shamila Ramcharan, the chairperson, Ms. Margaret McDowell, Ty Cross Loveless, Mr. Joseph Bertram, and Mr. Ashley Morris. I would also like to make a special acknowledgement to Mr. Kevin Kenny. I, he is the, the, one of the directors and actors in the movie, Ego 1677. So I would like to acknowledge that um, he has done a significant amount of work on this project. And I'd like to thank you and also to reach out to you. I would say that I was remiss in not um, contacting you, but this has been a hectic time for me and I'm sure I um, forgot to call you and engage you in this project. But thank you for all the hard work that you have done before. Ashley. Hi everyone. Um, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Boomer this morning. And it's always a great honor to introduce my PhD supervisor. And let me tell you why. So Ari Boomer studied cultural anthropology and prehistoric archeology span at the University of Amsterdam and Leiden University of the Netherlands. He worked as an archeologist at the Surinams Museum, Paramaibo Suriname, Leiden University, our own university, university of Amsterdam and our own University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad. In 2011, he retired as an assistant professor and senior researcher from the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University, but continues to serve as an honorary researcher at the faculty. Dr. Boomert serves as a guest lecturer, as a guest senior researcher at the Royal Netherlands Institute of South Asian and Caribbean Studies. He also he is also a curatorial affiliate at the Division of Anthropology, Yale University, New Haven in the USA. And he is the author of over 80 publications, including articles and scholarly articles and scholarly journals, papers in Congress proceedings, contributions to encyclopedias, edited works, book reviews, and several monographs. His research interests encompass the archaeology, anthropology, and ethno history of the West Indies, Guyanas, Venezuela, and Amazonia. Among, among this literature, he has produced a selection of um, literature on the history and archaeology of Trinidad and Tobago. Most notably, Trinidad, Tobago, and the Lower Orinoco Interaction Sphere, an archaeological and ethno-historical study published in 2000. And um, that's this book here, Bible. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, you can't see it. So I won't do that. But um, also he produced in 2016, the indigenous peoples of Trinidad and Tobago from the first settlers until today, published in 20. Well, I said that published in 2016. But aside from his publications, I needed to know that Dr. Boomer has been instrumental in the development of archaeology in Trinidad and Tobago. In the 1980s, he was an executive member of the now dormant National Archaeological Committee. And along with local archaeologist Peter Harris, he established the Archaeology Center at the University of the West Indies in Augustine, which is the nucleus of archaeology in this country. He helped establish that. Dr. Boomer also worked tirelessly with others like Archie Chow Chauhadra Singh to catalog this country's known archeological sites. And most notably to this um, lecture today, Dr. Boomer conducted a full archeological and historical survey of Tobago 
which he published in 1987. In 2005, the International Association of Caribbean Archaeology awarded him a plaque in recognition of years of dedicated service and commitment to the promotion and development of the archaeology of Trinidad and Tobago. He is married and is a father of two children and, and a grandfather of four grandchildren. Please welcome Dr. Ari Boomert. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's you want to say a few me. words? Okay. It's you an honor to me words? to be uh, able to give a talk to you. Okay, great. Okay. All right, so now we get into the pre-recorded lecture by Dr. Boomer. And we'll have a question and answer segment afterwards. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Well, depending on where you are, good morning or good afternoon. Today, I wish to discuss with you the first peoples of Tobago, the Amerindians, their past on the island and their relationship with the Europeans, especially the Dutch in historic times. And here first, have a look at the, uh, the uh, coat of arms of Tobago in 1816 and its motto, Pugrior Evenit, meaning she becomes or she merges more beautiful. Well, for anybody knowing the island, he would agree, he or she would agree that this motto was aptly chosen in uh, the early 19th century. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, well, starting with the history, we start with the names that have been applied to Tobago. And uh, the first name was coined by Columbus in 1498, when he was in the open sea between Grenada, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, he could see Tobago from a distance. And he wrote in his diary, I call this island Bella Forma because from a distance, it seemed beautiful. Well, as you see, ladies and gentlemen, even Columbus, uh, was a bit poetic once in a while. But nothing is heard of Bella Forma afterwards, and from 1511 onwards, the island is called Tobacco or Tobago, and later on that became Tobago, of course. Now, tobacco, uh, meaning tobacco, uh, is a Spanish word, actually it comes from Arab, and um, it uh, is, uh, of course, uh, the name of uh, tobacco, but also it was applied by the Spanish to the large cigars, the um, Taino Indians of the Greater Antilles, uh, were smoking at the time. And, and uh, I think uh, the name must have been given to Tobago because uh, by, by some uh, person from a vessel that passed by the island, possibly a slaver, and, and looked Hello, at yeah, the island and Hi, did so you get it? its contour closely resembled a cigar, a tobacco. And that is the name that remained. Now, there are a couple of other Amerindian names of the island, but it would take too, too much time to discuss their origin and etymology. There's one thing I would like to uh, note before uh, starting with the, uh, with the, the discussion of uh, the Amerindians. Uh, and that is that 
the attraction of the island to the Europeans, especially its geographical position, was similar to Europeans as to Amerindians. For the Amerindians, Tobago was a, a major stopover from the Windward Islands, uh, the, 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 the Lesser Antilles, to the Guyana coast. And for the Europeans, it was actually the same, but the other way around. Uh, from, from, the, uh, from the coast of the Guyanas to the, uh, to the Lesser Antilles, since uh, Tobago's position east of the Windward Islands made it uh, a perfect place uh, where you, in the time of sailing craft, could attack one of the islands or settlements of other uh, Europeans in the islands, yes? Now, uh, before Columbus, when did the first Amerindians uh, settle in Tobago? Now, well, you see it already. That was during the period uh, archaeologists called the Archaic Age, and that was yeah, about 3000 BC. Uh, these people, these first inhabitants of Tobago were hunters, fishers, small horticulturalists, collecting uh, collectors of shells, crabs, food plants, whatnot. But they didn't make pottery yet. And they made bottle shaped pestles, as you can see here, and artifacts of shell bone no pottery and uh, yeah they they lived actually in the area of the coral lowlands milford bonacore that area and and originally they came from and uh, at the side you see a picture of island carib indians from martinique next to a papaya tree yes Uh, it was about, well, 100 AD that the first pottery making Amerindians uh, moved into Tobago. They have been uh, migrating from the mainland of South America, especially the Orinoco Valley, into uh, the Antilles from, say, 300 BC onwards. And uh, the Amerindians that uh, we call them Saladoid people after Saladero, which is a site on the uh, archaeological site on the lower Orinoco. These people had pottery, but the same subsistence base as the uh, archaic peoples. Now you see here examples of that pottery from Tobago and it showed a lot of embellishments, uh, animal human-like embellishments on their, on their vessels, which are probably spirit beings, frogs, birds, turtles, etc. In the middle, uh, an armadillo, a tattoo bowl, and, um, uh, and also uh, human-like uh, faces, possibly. Uh, possibly uh, shamans, yes. We call this period the early ceramic age, and here are more of these so-called adornos, uh, embellishments in Spanish, and, and showing, yeah, uh, human uh, animal faces or mixed human animal faces, um, which have a distinctly spiritual uh, connotation. And you also see one of the things uh, the uh, uh, Amerindians of this period, the Saladoid people, were making uh, beads of uh, diorite. Uh, that is a white and, and black mottled uh, stone, a rock material which is found many places in central Tobago. And they use that to make uh, beads. And these beads were 
exchanged with other peoples in the uh, small islands. Yes. Yeah, in the that was the that were the period uh, was the period of the early ceramic age, and and in the late ceramic age from AD 850 until uh, you may say the time of Columbus, there were other uh, peoples living in Tobago, uh, also coming from Trinidad and the mainland, and they made a much less attractive pottery. Uh, practically no uh, adornos any longer, but they had they may still made these uh, beads of diorite and also. Uh, traded uh, beads from the mainland of made of crystal, quartz crystal and green turquoise, as you can see on this slide. Uh, the next uh, slide shows more of this kind of pottery and uh, we have ceremonial wear. Here you see some of the ceremonial wear with uh, yeah, an exceptional uh, part of a huge uh, vessel showing a human face. A spouted bottle is shown as well in the lower down, uh, and 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 that was used for inhalo, inhaling tobacco juice through the nose, so as to induce an ecstatic visionary trance to in order to contact the spirit world so it was a shamanic item yes the next stage of the next slide yeah the next slide this slide shows the stages in the relationship between the amerindians and the europeans in historic times and then that starts with 1498, of course, when, when Columbus uh, uh, saw Tobago for the first time. And we get the first documentary uh, evidence, the first written reports on the island. Well, that starts with trade and slave hunting, especially in the second half of the uh, uh, 16th century, early 17th century, uh, from Trinidad, uh, by uh, yeah, as soon as uh, Trinidad had been uh, settled by by the Spanish in the 1590s. Then, from 1614 until 1693, we see various attempts at colonization. Uh, you know, the island was was fought over by, by all European uh, nations and the Amerindians, after which we get a period that Tobago was a so-called neutral island, that is an island that was neither, uh, no, uh, 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 yeah, that was contested, but not settled by any of the Europeans. And then, Finally, from 1763 onwards, British French colonization. And keep in mind, by 1810, the last Amerindians departed from the island and went to Toko, to Northeast Trinidad. Now, there was a question, uh, one of the previous uh, 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 presentations about whether there would be uh, Spanish galleons loaded with gold perhaps be found once in the waters of Tobago. Well, I can answer on that question yes and no, because that was a very good question, because between Trinidad and Tobago, the sea strait is known as the Galleon's Passage. And actually, uh, occasionally, the so-called Terra Firme fleet of the Spanish 
past there in the uh, late 16th and 17th century, uh, galleons and merchants vessels that were destined to go to the mainland and, and occasionally uh, uh, went to uh, Margarita, Cumagua, etc. And further down to Cartagena in, in Colombia. But they came from Spain, so they didn't have any valuables on, on board. They went to collect gold, silver, whatnot on the coast of, of uh, 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 Venezuela and Colombia and Central America. And then they went out uh, to uh, 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 pass Florida back to Spain, loaded with, with valuables. So they may have passed by Tobago, and they would have occasionally, but not loaded with gold. Yes, uh, the next slide shows the changes of government of Tobago in historic times. And as you will know and, and see from uh, what I uh, put up this slide, the island was fought over by Spanish, Dutch, Corlanders, uh, the people from Latvia, English and French. And of course, all the time until the 1810s, there were Amerindians settled or visiting the island as well. And, and uh, you may make a, a difference between uh, Amerindians, Caribs, if you wish, uh, living on the island and Caribs, island Caribs from the uh, from the Windward Islands, especially St. Vincent, uh, Grenada, St. Lucia, Martinique, who regularly came down and, 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 uh, uh, and visited Tobago uh, most of the time in order to go down further uh, to the uh, Guyana coast in order to trade and to make war to other peoples. So uh, the European settlements in the 17th century, you must keep in mind, mostly comprised only a few hundred settlers each time. Most of the time, they didn't last long, uh, at least in the 17th century, only a few years, as you can see, with a few exceptions notably those of the Dutch in the mid 17th century. Uh, there's one other thing I should say in, at this stage, and that in the, until the 1650s, you may say, uh, the Dutch and the Corlanders, when we had documents uh, regarding uh, that matter, the Dutch and the Corlanders kept up reasonably peaceful relationships with the uh, Amerindians that were settled on the island, the Caribs that were living there. But simultaneously, they were often attacked by Amerindians coming down from St. Vincent and, and, uh, and the other islands of the Winters. Yes, now let us look at the first Dutch episode. Uh, the first, well, actually, uh, the first attempt at settlement was a Spanish one in 1614, uh, but that uh, did last only, uh, only uh, a few months. Uh, so it's not uh, very, uh, uh, it was not very long uh, lasting. First Dutch episode in 1628 uh, was an attempt to found a tobacco colony. And as you can see, smoking was a very much uh, popular 
thing in, in, in Holland, well, in Europe in general, at the time and uh, uh, before uh, tobacco had been uh, traded with the Caribbeans of the Windward Islands uh, by the Dutch and the French and, and the English, but uh, it was felt now we need more and, and more reliable uh, supply of tobacco. And, and that's why this, uh, uh, this settlement was, uh, was uh, undertaken. It went, it came from Vlissingen, Flushing, in, in, in English, and, and uh, that is a Zealand, uh, a place, uh, a port in Zealand, and uh, the island was called by the first Dutch settlers, New Walcheren, New Walcheren, which is the name of the island in Zealand on which Flushing is located. Uh, you see here the, the, the coat of arms of the province of, of Zealand, and uh, it's one of the provinces of the, of the Dutch Republic at the time. And uh, you see it shows a lion who is uh, rising and, uh, from the sea. Uh, the, uh, the Dutch settled at Great Courland Bay not yet called such uh, with his name by this time. They had a fort at Plymouth, and you see uh, the view from there on Great Corland Bay, and uh, a major one and a small one at Black Rock, now was nowadays called Fort Bennett. Um, and the settlement in between uh, the uh, the mouth of the Great Courland River, uh, there were yeah an, a, a few hundred Zealanders uh, living there. Yes, the uh, the patron of the of the colony was uh, Jan de Moor. That was uh, an important uh, figure in 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 Zealand in in Flushing. And he uh, he was actually uh, yeah, one of the a burgomaster and, and major merchant. Here we see uh, Great Cornan Bay and uh, a picture of uh, the fort now uh, Plymouth uh, at Plymouth, uh, the Great Fort and the small one at Black Rock. And if you note carefully, you see that guns are not only showing in the, in the, in the direction of the bay, but also towards the interior, as if the uh, settlers were kind of uh, yeah, wary that they may be attacked from there as well, not only from the sea, but yeah, perhaps from, from uh, hostile Amerindians. Uh, in, uh, well, they, they, they uh, organized, uh, uh, the, well, they, they had a treaty, they made a treaty with um, uh, Hiraima, the famous chief of, of uh, East Trinidad and Hiraima, uh, promised to raise tobacco for the Dutch, and and there were uh, there was a, a, a relationship that uh, was very friendly, at least with the Nepoyo of Trinidad, but with the Caribs, that was another story. Uh, it didn't come to uh, a reason. Uh, a long lasting relationship because as early as 1636, the Spanish attacked uh, the fort uh, landing in Canoe Bay, which is a, is a very uh, apt name to uh, that bay in Southwest Tobago because there that was the, the major 
landing of, of canoes from Trinidad, from say Balandra Bay, etc., from Northeast Trinidad, and the Spanish landed there and were able to conquer the fort. Uh, that was the end of, of the colony and, and uh, the first Dutch colony and uh, against all uh, yeah, of the treatment they made uh, for surrender, the Dutch settlers were taken to Kumana and, and most of them were hanged up there. Very few uh, um, escaped. That made was the end of the first Dutch colony. Now, uh, following that uh, period, first Dutch period, the English made a few attempts at settlement, nothing very successful. They did similar thing in Tobago and they lasted, oh, in, uh, sorry, in Trinidad, and they lasted only a few years either. Now, uh, the Corlanders were more successful. And uh, who were the Corlanders? Latvians under Duke Jacobs, it's a duchy uh, at the time, normally uh, under Poland. And um, uh, Dutch, uh, the Duke, Jacobs uh, sent out ships to settle Tobago. He had uh, a feeling that he should settle Tobago. And since the Dutch had disappeared from Tobago, it was now uh, the, uh, his place. And what they did was to refurbish the fortress at Plymouth, the former Dutch fortress, and, and it's now the site of that peculiar Corlander uh, monument. But nobody has ever done any uh, excavations up there. So that is still available for, for, uh, uh, yeah, for archaeological work. And what is interesting, the then governor of Tobago, and that was about 1650, made a drawing of the fort and uh, showed an Amerindian village close by it. Now, we don't know whether uh, his drawing was uh, of the fort was actually as it looked like or as he wanted it to become and, and wanted to show the Duke, uh, well, we are doing a good job. The, the interesting thing is this drawing of the, of the, of the, the, the village, the Amerindian village, is actually the only one we have, uh, which is, uh, very, seems to be very reliable, of the island Caribs in the entire Lesser Antilles. So it's a very important a very important drawing, a very important map. Now, uh, the situation of the court and the settlement up there was rather bad uh, because settled close to the Corland River between Plymouth and Black Rock was an area of, of mangrove and, and malaria infested. Many settlers died within a year. Yes, the next. Yes. Yeah, and then the second Dutch episode started in 1654. And mind you, at the time, the Corlanders were still living on the other side of the island in the Plymouth area. But the Dutch settled now at, yeah, Rockley Bay, what is now Rockley Bay, at Scarborough. And the, the one who, who organized this was Cornelis Lampsins, a very wealthy merchant and a very important person in the Dutch West India Company, uh, also from, from uh, Flushing. And uh, his attempt at settlement was very ambitious and rather, uh, rather successful. But it, uh, yeah, had the problem was 
the, the wars the Dutch had with the English and later on with the French, and, and that meant the end of the colony in 1672. Uh, he settled at Lower Town and he had a fort at what is still Dutch Fort because you heard, uh, and, and at, later on, the Sterreshans of Binkes, or Benkes if you wish, was built at what is Dutch Fort, but before that, Lumpsins had his major fort at this place already. And the how Milford Road, or uh, Carrington Road, as it's now called, uh, had a number of, of uh, houses uh, standing. Elsewhere, the Dutch settled at uh, uh, places like Sandy Point on the Win Winford Coast at Minster Bay, Mesopotamia, and as far northeast as uh, Hillsborough Bay. Minster Bay, uh, formerly Minster Bay, was called Sluggards Bay, literally. Uh, Lauwards Bay in Dutch, Sluggards Bay, because uh, up there a colony of a group of of turtlers uh, had settled, which could just wait until the turtles were walking up the beach under their houses, and it took was no effort to uh, to to capture these oversized animals. Well, the colony of, of, of uh, Lampsins was quite, uh, quite successful. He grew sugar cane, ginger, cotton, etc., etc. In 1666, there were 18 sugar mills. And a famous book was written by Charles de Rochefort about Tobago first detailed description of the island in this period, in the Dutch period. And, and you see that uh, up there, uh, Cornelis Lamsins uh, felt a little bit threatened because he had little, uh, he didn't get much uh, assistance in terms of, of soldiers and the thing from uh, the Dutch Republic and he went to the uh, the king uh, of France and and was raised a peerage and could call himself the Baron of Tobago but the French were not sending him any assistance either. Now what is interesting is Another place where the Dutch settled was Rasphuis Bay, Rasphuis Bay, and that is present Bloody Bay. Uh, and that is that is interesting. In the Dutch period, in this period, it was called the Rasphuis Bay, and a Rasphuis was at the time a correctional institution where petty criminals had to grind tropical dye woods or for textile dyes. And uh, it, it, it can be conjectured that uh, the Dutch cut these uh, dye woods, uh, the famous uh, a, a Tobago name for famous dye wood is bloodwood, and, and had the logs uh, through the Bloody Bay River uh, drifting down to the bay, thereby coloring the uh, the water of the bay red, and and so uh, in 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 common uh, thought, bloody bay, it was blood. Uh, the, <laughs> the blood wood colored the 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 bay red, and and later on all sorts of nonsense stories were made up that there was a a major uh, f fight between fleets uh, up there where many people uh, died, nothing of the kind. It was the, uh, uh, the blood or the, 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 the uh, red dye from the blood boot. Yeah, well, 
um, the last Dutch stand was, and you've heard a lot of on that already in 1676 and 77, because uh, the the colony of of, of uh, Lamsins was attacked by the Dutch, of, uh, by by the English and and Jamaica. Uh, buccaneers and, and English from uh, from uh, Barbados because there were the Anglo-Dutch wars going in between and and there was one time that the Dutch tried again to settle Tobago and that was in these two years when uh, the island was sold by uh, Lamsins to uh, the Admiralty of of uh, Amsterdam, and uh, they sent uh, Binkus, Jacob Binkus, uh, or Bankus, if you wish, uh, to Tobago, and he tried to uh, uh, defend the island uh, against the uh, the French. And you've heard of the two attacks of Destray, the French. Uh, on uh, the uh, on Tobago, uh, the Stereshans, uh, the, the star-shaped fort, he made a temporary sort of thing, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, there were two attacks, uh, one in in March and and the other one in in November December 1677, and uh, that was it meant the end of the Dutch uh, presence in Tobago. It was simply a fireball uh, that landed in the powder house in, in, the, in the fort and uh, close by it, Binkus and his, all of his officers were having their lunch and it meant the end of the fort. Uh, there were, I think, 480 people inside uh, inside the fort at the time, and there were only 250 left. So the French uh, got Tobago, and um, uh, the Dutch uh, went and didn't come back. Yeah. And uh, after that, there were a couple of times that the Corlanders made attempts to settle, none of them very successful. Well, I can only say not successful at all. And from 1693 onwards, uh, Tobago became what you may call a neutral island. And that lasted until 1763, when after the uh, Seven Years' War, uh, Britain uh, was able to settle the island. Now, in this period, uh, there were, uh, the island was not settled by, by any European nation, because the French and the, the, the English, uh, the British, made uh, uh, yeah, uh, claim the island for themselves, but uh, 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 none was allowed to uh, to settle there. And and there was one one moment in the 1640s that the French dared to settle in 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 Tobago it, at Lambo, and uh, but they were they were uh, France was was. Uh, Corrected by the British, who said, "Out of there! Otherwise, we attack you." And and the French went back to where they came from, Martinique. Now there were many Amerindians living on the island in, at the time, and and uh, many of them had come with uh, the French in the 1740s from from Martinique, but there were also uh, French uh, turtlers living in the island and mixed with, with the Amerindians. And uh, occasionally it was used for uh, refreshing and refitting by English and French uh, vessels. The northern part of the island uh, was used at 
times by pirates and and there is still a pirate bay uh, one of the uh, parts of of uh, men of war bay uh Bajans came down from barbados to cut wood because that island didn't have any wood for the left for the for the boiling houses uh, of the sugar industry and they came down to tobago to cut wood uh occasionally there were uh yeah immigrations immigrations of of, of amerindians from various parts uh, especially from the windward islands so and uh, for instance there is still a, a, a bay on on the windward coast uh, called uh, king peter's bay that was a king peter um, an amerindian who who lived there with his family in the 1760s and uh, that name is still there. There is an Indian walk uh, behind uh, King Peter's Bay, which reminds of this same uh, Amerindian. Uh, there were other Amerindians of which we have the name, uh, King Cardinal uh, close to uh, uh, Queen's Bay and uh, uh, the so-called King Roussel on Signal Hill, uh, close to uh, Scarborough, although he was not an Amerindian, he was a Frenchman, married with an Amerindian wife, and well, so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, there is one thing I want to say about Crusoe and Daniel Defoe. Uh, Crusoe, was of course an imaginary person uh, but the fact that Defoe chose Tobago as an in uninhabited island uh, was is significant because in fact to the Europeans in their mind it was uninhabited it was not settled by the uh, dutch or the french or the english it was yeah left open so to speak and and as such uh, it's very likely and there are other uh, reasons to assume that as well that uh, tobago was crusoe's island and i have only to remind you of Crusoe's cave on Crown Point, which uh, is a very interesting place. Although Crusoe <laughs> never lived there, of course, but uh, excavations have been made inside the cave and, and, and now extinct animals dating from the last ice age, a glyptodon, uh, in fact, a giant tattoo, has been found in there, and uh, maybe it's it's a disappointment for the youngsters among us. No dinos, no dino. They have not been found out there. Anyway, uh, so uh, the the fact that Daniel Defoe uh, chose Tobago is significant. Well, as you uh, know, 1763. Um, we get the end of the Seven Years' War, and, and Tobago was, as one of the ceded islands uh, given by the French, uh, the French lost, and, and they gave it to the uh, British uh, and other ceded islands, Grenada, etc. Now, the British made a huge effort of surveying mapping the island and dividing it to in lots and and yeah it was put up for sale the the whole island was divided into uh into uh, lots uh, for plantations and and uh, yeah well scottish irish english that is uh, flocked in scarborough was developed uh and uh, 
well, you have a picture of uh, Main Street Scarborough from the early 19th century. And uh, I made a sort of paste up of a, a series of, of very important or monumental uh, aspects of, of, of uh, the island. Uh, you see the uh, uh, water wheel and steam engine of uh, Franklin's uh, uh, behind Arnold's Vale, better known as the Arnold's Vale water wheel. And on top, uh, there is a picture of uh, the French conquest of to uh, Tobago in 1781. Well, so it was British, but there were periods that the French occupied it as well. And yeah, at the back, uh, you see one of the monuments that is uh, very much uh, discussed these days, and that is the Rocky Point Fort, uh, which we sh I'll, I shall uh, return to at the next uh, slide. Uh, which shows more of the uh, monuments, plantation of plantation times, uh, because that is what we are talking about. And, and, and uh, I like to uh, remind you that uh, these monuments are valuable, very valuable, because they remind us of the past and how Tobago came to be uh, what it is right now. Uh, look at the Moravian church. Uh, this one is from, from Blackrock. And uh, uh, in the period shortly after emancipation, uh, many of the uh, former enslaved Africans who worked on the plantations uh, moved away from them and uh, formed uh, new villages, often around a Methodist or Moravian church. Well, there are the sugar mills, uh, the sugar mills of friendship you see here, and keep in mind, none of them still have their wings. Huh? And, and the sugar mills without wings are typical uh, of, of the West Indies. There are only a few that have been restored as they were originally. But there are still quite a few in Tobago. Water wheel uh, and steam engine. Here, uh, the, uh, water, uh, the water wheel again from, from Franklin's down below. Uh, but also uh, that uh, from uh, Speyside on the top. And what below the Moravian church, you see the aqueduct at Louis d'Or, just beyond Roxborough. And in the middle, the huge aqueduct at Providence in central Tobago, that is a massive thing, 40 meters wide, more than 20 meters high. Very, very impressive monument. A great house, of course, at, at uh, Richmond, not that old, I should say, and a, uh, a very interesting, very, very, very interesting monument. And that is a rifle hole in a townhouse at Picton Street in Scarborough. And uh, there are more of these uh, yeah, lower stories of cellars, you may say, at street level in Scarborough, where you still see rifle holes. And I think they were intended uh, to to uh, yeah to be used as 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 uh, as defense mechanisms against uh, 
resurrections of, of, of slaves. And in the 1770s, there were so, several of these uh, slave rebellions. And in 1769, there was one, 1771 and 1774, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, the people living in these townhouses, the, the rich, uh, they were afraid for uh, resurrections in the and attacks. Now, several of these at this house at, at Picton Street, uh, I don't know whether it is still there. It's it's a ruin, and and uh, it was actually uh, a, a lower a lower uh, story made of faced volcanic stone and and bricks and uh, um, um, and it had an upper story of 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 uh, wood and uh, it burned down but the lower story still stands it stood there it's ne it's next uh, to the um, methodist uh, primary school primary girls school if i'm uh, primary school uh, there are others which you may, the, the Tobogonians among you, may pass by without actually noticing. For instance, rifle holes in the Anglican Girls High School at Becolet Street. Uh, there were formerly, at least, in, in Studley Park, great which was uh, refurbished as a great house later on. Uh, that This was the place where the first House of Assembly uh, was was uh, having its meetings originally, and then there is there are a few rifle holes in the in the side wall of Scotiabank downtown uh, Scarborough at Lower Town at, at at the junction of of what is now Carrington Street and Garden Side Street. Scotia Bank, the site has rifle holes. So that means that that part of the building dates back to, uh, yeah, to, you may say, the 1770s at least. Uh, what we see more of uh, a gun, of course. And yeah, this is the last of my, uh, my slides. Uh, a couple of coppers. These are from Mount St. George. And um, yeah, picture uh, of, of uh, Fort King George with, with, a, with a gun and at the back, the, the uh, officer's mess. Um, and a number of pictures of the Rocky Point fort. Uh, it shows, uh, yeah, well, that Rocky Point Fort is an <clears throat> interesting thing because it may, and I say may, go back to Corland at times, because we know that in the end of the 17th century, uh, the Corlanders had a, had a fort at this location. But at any rate, later on, in the uh, 1760s, uh, this became uh, a battery of the British. And it, what it shows, you see uh, uh, an entry to a powder house. It has a strong house and, and uh, uh, a powder house and, and a, an embankment, uh, yeah, more or less, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with formally at least six guns, and you see uh, one of them. It shows the Tudor uh, double rose emblem, and that means that it is a gun that was made until at most uh, 1680. Uh, most of the guns you see in uh, the cannon, you see in, in in Fort King George and Fort Milford, and so on and so forth are uh, uh, show the the uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the later 
uh, a later emblem, uh, not the Tudor double rows, uh, the George Rex emblem, GR. Uh, Fort James uh, has the same. Keep in mind, Fort James uh, at Plymouth, uh, that it, the name is fully incorrect. It was in the 1950s that the then warden of Tobago, Tom Cambridge, uh, told the Torres board that uh, this was the old quarrel in the fort. And uh, well, they made up signs and everything. And, and since that time, it's called Fort James. But actually, the actual Fort James or Fort Jacobs in that view is at or was at the place of the Dutch fort at Plymouth, uh, at, at, on top of the cliff high above the Corland River. Now, uh, Rocky Point Fort then uh, is yeah, one of the uh, uh, still untouched um, fortresses uh, in the island. And, and, and to my mind, it should be, uh, uh, it should be protected whenever it comes to uh, hotel development at this place. Yes. Yeah, well, that is the end of uh, plantation times. And, and, and don't forget what I said about these, these uh, uh, rifle holes. Uh, they are, as it were, silent remembrances of slavery times. And there are few monuments reminding of the uh, slave labor that made these plantations of the 18th, 19th century possible. And so I think they should, in a sense, yeah, be kept as far as possible. Now back to the Amerindians. Uh, I told you already, the last Amerindians left Fort Tobago in about 1810. One of the last of them was a, 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 somebody called Louis. And uh, whether that is uh, significant or not, I don't know, but he lived at Louis d'Or and especially at Indian Point, which got up for sale, I, I, I noticed uh, just a few days ago. Uh, Indian Point, Louis, and Louis uh, came from, actually from, from St. Vincent in the 1740s, um, and, and he lived there with his family at the uh, estate of, of uh, Sir William Young, uh, the governor of Tobago at the time, uh, who, by the way, died in a duel with uh, his neighbor. And uh, uh, Sir William Young has written down uh, a couple of uh, uh, conversations which he had with Louis. Uh, later on, Louis. Uh, one of the last Amerindians, apparently, of Tobago, perhaps apart, uh, apart from, uh, from King Peter's uh, uh, people, went up to the north and, and later on uh, left the island because the Amerindians, as the Amerindians said, there was no possibility of walking around uh, and, and doing their their thing hunting and so on, uh, since everywhere uh, there were plantations and people chasing them away. Uh, I show you one of the last island Caribs living. Uh, well, uh, in, in, they are still there, uh, descendants of the island Caribs in the Windward Islands on St. Vincent and, of course, on Dominica. Uh, not speaking about the mainland, of course, and Trinidad. 
uh, this was a, a, a painting very well done by Agosto Brunias around 1770. And, uh, but here they still live in the, uh, yeah, in the, in, in the 19th century also. Now, while well, the Amerindians of Tobago became marginalized. Although it must be said that when the, uh, the British uh, divided uh, the island into lots for sale, they left uh, lots for the uh, resident Amerindians they came across. Um, but uh, those who, uh, who lived there, uh, a court, uh, that is recorded, sold their lots to, uh, to other people and left for Trinidad, uh, for Toko, where they could still live without much pressure from Europeans because Toko was a refuge not only for 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 Amerindians from Tobago, but also for escaped and slave Africans, and and still the 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 remembrance and and the connections with uh, Tobago in Toko and also with Saint Vincent are very strong over there. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And I am <laughs> I'm glad to listen to any questions you might have. Uh, you want me to uh, discuss the questions that no. uh, were written yeah. down in the chats? Well, I mean, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Boomer, for oh. your presentation. I just wanted to say that, and I'm, I'm going over to Dr. Guy now um, for a few words before we start the, the questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Professor Boomer, I'd just like to thank you. Um, quite an interesting, riveting um, lecture. And I just want to say, as the director of the Scarborough Harbor Project, I want to thank you. And because you explained, gave us some very explicit explanations as to particularly in the names of places. So I want to also thank the Dutch Embassy, Ambassador Vargas, for inviting me to do this project. So again, to the participants, I wanna say thank you. And to the supporters, particularly the um, library in Vlissinger, the library in St. Martin, the Maritime Museum in Curacao. And I know that these, this lecture series will be made available to the students in Trinidad and Tobago and also the wider Caribbean. Again, I say thank you, Professor Beaumont, and then you can now start the questions. Yeah, well, uh, the well, first question I got, mm -hmm. or... Uh, well, what, what we can do is I will um, read out the questions to you and we can have a conversation about it. I think that works best. Um, that's what we've been doing for the past couple of months, for the past couple of weeks. So we can start with, um, let me see, the first one you've got, was from Ambassador Varga actually, and he had to leave. So he was at you know, he was inquiring about your publications and um, if they're available in Trinidad and if you can make them available in Trinidad. Well, um, let me uh, tell this, uh, bookshops have to order <laughs> the books with the editors of with, with, the, with the publisher mm -hmm. and um, uh, that is that is what should be done. Uh, now, my last publication is this one, uh, the Indigenous Peoples of Trinidad and Tobago. That can be ordered online uh, 
with the with the uh, publisher, and that is uh, Sidestone Press in 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 Holland, and um, uh, then it will be uh, just it will be sent. I I trust. I trust. Uh, that is what I can say on on this matter. Okay. Um, uh, I think this is the only book that is available. No, there is another one too. There are several books which can be ordered online. Okay. All right. We go into the other the, the other question now. Um, Someone asks, the Amerindians lived in villages, I guess. What would have been the population size and how many such villages were there at a time? Yeah, well, that is a splendid question also to me. Uh, the Amerindians lived in villages and, and we know from the documentary evidence that there were Amerindians in Tobago all the time uh, until yeah, well, as I said, about the 1810s. The thing is that uh, we don't know them archaeologically. Archaeological sites of these villages dating from the historic period, uh, keep that in mind, are unknown. We haven't found them. We've looked for them, definitely but we haven't yet found them. So we cannot say how many there were. Uh, the only thing is that uh, we can look at uh, the maps and the documentary evidence from, yeah, especially that period uh, between, uh, well, in the first half of the 18th century, huh? the, 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 the neutral period. And then you would say, well, there were, perhaps a couple of hundred uh, people living, say 500 or so, uh, that's all, that's all. But there were French turtlers living in the island as well, and they live mixed with these uh, French turtlers. And by the way, the Amerindians who lived in Tobago at the time uh, were very much gallicized. Uh, they, they, they spoke, French to a certain extent, and many of the uh, place names which date back to this period of neutrality um, are French or are Dutch, but became Gallicized. So uh, that was, a, 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 and when the British came in 1763, they renamed everything but they didn't succeed in uh, renaming all places. No, there were Gallicized uh, names or, or French names that continued to uh, exist. And, and, and the British didn't succeed in replacing these names. So, well, for instance, an interesting name is Buku. Uh, Buku is actually a French name. Boko, and meaning harbor entrance. This refers to the fact that from there you could enter uh, Bonacor Lagoon. And, and that name has remained. And so there are many more uh, French names or uh, Gallicized Dutch names that remained. And the, English were not successful in replacing them, although they wanted that, of course, because uh, it meant uh, naming a place means that it, you own it. Huh? That's why uh, Columbus was uh, very much uh, willing to uh, give names, uh, Spanish names, to, to all places he came across in the West Indies. Because as soon as you name it, you own it, at least uh, in, your, uh, in your mind. So it's difficult to say what the population size was. Uh, 
I can guess in, in uh, yeah, well, maybe 500 to 1,000 people all together in, in Tobago in the, in the first half of the 18th century, including Amerindians and French, French, especially turtles. And not counting the Barbadians who came down to cut wood and, and, and so on because they came and went again. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question, it makes mention of your 1987 survey in Tobago. And this person is asking about, uh, I guess, a quote from that um, publication. Um, the quote was mentioned by Rochefort, most likely referring to the second Lampson's period, that Dutch colonization of Tobago Looked at, looked at new areas in the Windward Coast, Holland Fantasy, Dutch Plantation, in Gloucester, Bulgaria. Are there any more details available? I, I think that you can read it from the chat so you can see what he's saying. Are there any more details available from this area? Well, regarding uh, especially the mentioned uh, sites, uh, mm -hmm. Dutch Plantation in Goldsboro, Four Mons, and former castle in North Bell Garden area. There isn't much I can say about uh, these places except for what I wrote in that uh, report. Uh, Fourmouth Castle is an interesting location because there was a plantation there with a Dutch, uh, a Dutch plantation owner, but he had. Uh, uh, yeah, strengthened uh, the place by putting up a gun, and 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 uh, apparently that was because he felt he could be attacked, and the attacks would have been by uh, uh, by Amerindians from yeah from Saint Vincent, Caribs Island, Caribs from Saint Vincent, and later on. And, and uh, on the map, former castle refers to the fact that this plantation house was, yeah, uh, like a fort. Huh? It was a, like a castle. It was like a fort. And um, yeah, well, that is all we know about it. And, and uh, I put everything in, in that. Uh, uh, what I know in that in that report, uh, but what we did at the time was also especially look at the places where the Dutch lived in the or had their uh, plantations in the in the 17th century, and uh, taking the detailed information from uh, the book by uh, Charles de Rochefort, with, to which I referred. Uh, when I talked about the, the Lampson's period. And I'd like to publicly thank you for compiling that report because it's vital information for cultural heritage in Tobago. And I know many people, Gabriele uses it today. I use it as well in, as a resource. So I want to publicly thank you for putting that together. And I hope that in the future we could probably revisit it to see. And I think that a lot of people are doing that in Tobago right now, revisiting those uh, accounts to see if these places still exist or are still intact. So that's an important thing that we could do because that's 1987, that's a while now, you know? So we, we have some work to do there. So moving forward, um, let's see. Right, I have, a, I have a comment by Mr. Kenny. He, he, he says, um, he finds it incredible that forts such as Rockley, Rocky Bay, Rocky Bay is not protected by the National Trust or the THA. Um, insofar as the National Trust, Mr. Kenny, um, I can say that we're working very hard to focus on Tobago and in, in, in this um, batch of listen that we're proposing for next year and beyond. We, we're trying hard to focus on the sites in Tobago more than we, we were doing before. So definitely you can look out and you can make suggestions about sites that you think are, are worthy of national recognition and send us an email to 
Heritage at National Trust at TT with those suggestions, and we will look at those suggestions. Um, okay, moving forward. Let's see. Okay, so in keeping with the meaning, because you mentioned Bloody Bay, which was very interesting, that story. Right, right. Bay. Yeah, in yeah. keeping with the meaning of the Dutch name of Bloody Bay, were, they, were the settlers who were sent their criminals on punishment? And I would add, were these criminals locals or was it um, tantamount to what the English would do, send people to the colonies or Barbados people? I'm interested to know if they were foreigners sent to Tobago like that as well. Well, we don't know. We absolutely don't know who went there. The only thing we have is that name, uh, that name uh, uh, Rasp House Bay. And uh, this is my explanation of that name, but who went, who were sent there? I don't know. Maybe, uh, People were sent there and, and uh, didn't like it at all to work uh, up there and, and, and uh, to cut uh, bloodwood. And, and they made that connection with a, with a rasp house where they did the same. But whether they were indeed uh, criminals, settlers, it could well be, but I doubt it. I doubt it. I think, uh, uh, no, well, I cannot answer the question. <laughs> that is quite <laughs> simple. <laughs> it is, uh, at least we, we see an explanation of the name of Bloody Bay, and it has nothing to do with any uh, contest or, or, or uh, uh, vessels of nations that, that fought each other in the bay and, and, and the blood uh, uh, coloring the waters. No, it has to do with, with uh, cutting dye woods. But who went there in the Dutch period? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so moving on, we have a question from Margaret McDowell, chairman of the National Trust. She asked, um, I was interested in discovering that there were first peoples from East Trinidad and Tobago. So what were the names of the other first people groups active in Tobago? Yeah, well, um, the first, keep in mind, if you speak about the first peoples and if you uh, 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 want to discuss the prehistoric, the pre-Columbian period, huh, before uh, 1498, then we, what we do, archaeologists, is to give names to a cultural group uh, from a particular site, a major uh, archaeological site. So in the early ceramic period, or before that, in the archaic period, we speak of the Ortuaroid people, called after the Ortuara River in Trinidad, but the Ortuaroid people, and, and the early ceramic uh, age in, in Tobago, we speak of the Saladoid people, called after Saladero, a site on the lower Orinoco. <coughs> Uh, late ceramic period, we speak of the Trumasoid people, and that is called after Trumasoy, which is a site in St. Lucia. And, and uh, we don't have their own names, quite simply, because no, no one has, they, they, they didn't uh, write down, uh, they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the, the uh, ability of uh, uh, writing, and that's why uh, we have names for them starting only with the historic period, uh, starting with Columbus and, and uh, the other Europeans after him. And then we know that uh, from that period, uh, 
uh, we know there were Caribs living and uh, in Tobago, and especially Caribs related to the Caribs of the mainland. And uh, well, that is a kind of complicated story because the Caribs who live in the Windward Islands uh, felt themselves to belong to the Carib people ethnically. They felt to belong to the same people, Caribs from the islands and Caribs from the mainland, but Caribs from the mainland spoke Caribbean and the Carib island Caribs spoke, uh, in fact, Arawakan, a different language, but with a number of uh, Caribbean words. So it's not uh, that you can say they felt to be Carib, so they spoke Caribbean. That depends on the area. The, apparently, the Caribs of Tobago spoke Caribbean and felt to belong most closely to the Caribs of the mainland. And they call themselves uh, Kalina. And those in the islands call themselves Kalina Go. And uh, Go is just a honorific uh, suffix, but Kalina meaning the people. Uh, that, that is quite simple. So by calling themselves by the, in fact the same name, they expressed their feeling to belong to the same ethnic unity. Anyway, that so you may say in historic times, at least in the uh, 17th century, uh, starting in the 16th, 17th century, there were Kalina Caribs living in Tobago. That, that is what you can say. And, and later on also, but there were others coming there too. Okay. On that point, um, I'd like you to also expand on the, the communication between Trinidad and Toko, the Amerindian communication, because you mentioned that in your presentation. And I found that was interesting that they would, um, some of them feeling pressure in Tobago would migrate to Toko because it was a remote area of Trinidad. Could you expand on that as well? Excuse me. Um, oh, you didn't hear? You didn't hear what yes, I said? Yes. Okay. I, I didn't follow. Uh, okay, so you mentioned, following up to that question, you mentioned the communication between Tobago and Toko. Yeah. And um, you, you mentioned that indigenous people from Tobago sometimes feeling the pressure from from the Europeans in Tobago would migrate yeah. to yeah. Toko. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. if you could expand on that because that's an interesting um, connection there between Trinidad and Tobago at that point in time. Yeah, well, um, that is what we gather from uh, the sparse uh, documentary evidence from this period regarding the Amerindians. Uh, and uh, perhaps there is more to be found somewhere in the archives, but what I've seen, uh, yeah, there is a lot on the plantations, the plantation owners and, and what happened uh, in the islands, but little on, on yeah, especially uh, the, uh, uh, the life ways and, and, and what happened to the Amerindians. And we can conclude they well what louis said and louis told uh, to uh, william young uh, that uh, they felt uh, yeah kind of marginalized and and threatened at times and 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 felt uh, that the island was entirely taken over by by europeans and 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 uh, of course, the enslaved uh, Africans, and and uh, there was no place any longer for them. And uh, they knew that that to, uh, Toko, uh, yeah, 
was an area where you could still settle free and so on and so forth. And, and of course, the, the, the Northeast trend that was easy to reach from Tobago. Huh? The, you went from, uh, from Canoe Bay uh, in the south, and uh, the name is, is significant, of course, Canoe Bay, to Balandra Bay and, and, and uh, so on and so forth. And Toko, uh, the Spanish didn't have much uh, interest in, in that area. Uh, there was a, a mission there, and, and, uh, and there was still space where you could uh, could settle. That is that is uh, what we what we know about uh, that area. Also from uh, uh, documentary uh, yeah, er evidence from from Trinidad, of course. And um, yeah, well, and of course we all know the connection between uh, Tobago and, and, and Toko has been very strong. Uh, I can refer to a book by uh, uh, Herskovic and Herskovic, uh, two American anthropologists who uh, worked in Toko a long time ago, I think in the 40, 1940s or something, 1950s, and uh, they discussed the, the life in that area in that period. And then there is, uh, yeah, uh, a reference to these connections uh, uh, repeatedly. Uh, also, uh, the Toko area was an area which had very strong relations with St. Vincent. Now, there were quite a few people from St. Vincent, including Amerindians, who came down and settled in, in, in the Toko area or, or uh, slightly uh, further down, Kumana or something like that. And um, yeah, it, 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 was a, it was or is an area with, it was an area with, with very uh, <laughs> extensive uh, relationships. And um, uh, yeah, uh, of course, many uh, escaped African slaves uh, from Tobago and settled uh, in, in Togo. That, that is well known. And um, so, uh, that is what I can say on that connection with uh, with Toko, with Northeast Trinidad. Okay. Um, moving on, I have a question here by Dr. Pemberton. She asks, is there any documentation and or surviving evidence of the food practices of the Dutch settlers in Tibet? Well, uh, that is a... No, no, no. Hmm. Not to my knowledge. We know what they uh, grew in Tobago, but these were things, uh, crops uh, for the export, huh? for for the for the market uh, to send back to uh, to Europe, and uh, a little, actually, little on their food practices, but I think uh, knowing the Dutch, <laughs> since I am one, I think they would have, uh, would have adapted rapidly to the local situation. They would have uh, adapted rapidly to to eating ground provisions and 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 everything that uh, uh, the uh, yeah the, the the country uh, the Tobago uh, uh, has to has to offer uh, and and they would have uh, uh, eaten what 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 uh, people. <laughs> Would nowadays and um, uh, eat of fruits and 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 uh, all that kind of thing. So there is no information suggesting 
that there was food food uh, taken from Holland or or something. Uh, maybe yeah liquor. Yes, uh, there would have been wine and, and, and Jennifer and that sort of thing. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt about it. That would have important, did, that would have been important. But for the rest, they would have adapted to the local, uh, local, uh, locally available uh, food, eating a lot of fish, of course. And, and uh, kingfish, I would say. <laughs> and uh, what else? Uh, uh, well, there is in Tobago to be had. Okay. Um, and finally, um, we have a question about the, the dye woods and the logwood. Um, I don't know if you could expand on maybe the genus and species of the diwood and the logwood. I'm not really sure what the question, uh, uh, what the participant is asking here, but... Well, the diwood, uh, yeah, this refers to particular trees which can be used to, uh, uh, to dye, especially, especially textiles, but they did. The dyes can be used for other things as well, of course. But, uh, uh, and logs, yeah, they may have cut logs as well. And, and uh, by uh, uh, cutting them in the forest up there and having them uh, drifting with the, with the river towards the bay, all of these uh, dye woods and log woods could be uh, loaded uh, on board of a vessel, and that vessel would, would go down or uh, go up uh, to uh, to Holland again, or proceed further into the West Indies and 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 so on. Uh, but what is called uh, the most famous dye wood in in Tobago is what is called blood wood. And I have to check uh, and find the, uh, <laughs> the Latin name for it. I, I don't know the Latin name on top of my head, but uh, uh, that was a, uh, a major thing. And, and there were a, a lot of things in the tropical forest and, and Tobago has tropical forest, of course, which in Europe, were very much in demand, uh, starting with, of course, uh, tobacco and so on. And, and uh, 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 there were many other uh, dyes and, and gums and, and, and all that kind of thing, which uh, were unknown in Europe and very much uh, wanted. Yeah. As, as a part of this question as well, could you expand on um, the, under the British period, you mentioned that because of the deforestation of Barbados and the need for timber and lumber, they would come to Tobago to harvest um, timber. So could you expand yeah, well, on that? Because that's also an interesting connection. Not timber, but fuel wood. Huh? Fuel wood, okay. Fuel wood. Well, they even went uh, as far as Saint Lucia. It's well well known that uh, the uh, the Barbadians went out for for yeah went as far as the the Windward Islands to get uh, fuel wood for their boiling houses because the whole place was based on on sugar cane uh, cultivation and 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 processing. And these boiling houses had to be uh, fed, of course, with, uh, yeah, with fuel. And Barbados uh, was uh, rapidly uh, denuded of, of all, all forest uh, they had and, and uh, still is. And uh, so uh, they had to go 
to the islands where there were quite some forests and, and where they could uh, cut the wood to be uh, burned in the, in the boiling houses. And that is what they did. And that's why they came to, uh, to Tobago. Uh, in this period when there was nobody telling them, uh, no way, huh? it was a neutral uh, island. Uh, it wasn't uh, inhabited by uh, neither French nor Dutch nor, 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 nor English. So nobody could uh, keep them away and, and, and tell them not to, uh, not to um, do this sort of thing. So they cut their uh, fuel wood and uh, returned to, uh, to Barbados. That is the thing. Okay, so there are no other questions, I think. So I think we will um, bring the proceedings to an end here. Thank you so very much, Dr. Boomer, for taking the time to, to give us this lecture this morning and afternoon where you are. Um, it was extremely informative. Um, the images that you used, some of them um, are unknown to me. I love that image of Main Street that you had. That, that's something that, that is very interesting. And I'd also like to thank um, the hosts of this um, lecture series, the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands uh, in Port of Spain. And also, um, I'd like to extend my thanks to you, Dr. Boomer, from the National Trust for this lecture as well. And I hope that we would come together next Friday for the next lecture. You have it in front of me. But that information will be made available to you, um, the, the next lecture, lecturer and so forth. So thank you everyone for coming today. And I hope to see you again next Friday when we do this again. Thank you so much and have a good Friday. Bye-bye.